We have been studying the prophecy of Revelation 10. And uh, I'll just go through the sequence of this chapter very quickly. Uh, the good news is that all of the presentations are available on DVD. And also, uh, many of you already have the syllabus. And uh, has the syllabus been helpful? <clears throat> it really, I think it helps a lot to follow the sequence. But anyway, uh, in Revelation chapter 10, we have a mighty angel. Who is that mighty angel? That mighty angel is Jesus. In other words, this message from this chapter comes directly from Jesus. And he descends from heaven and he has in his hand what? <clears throat> a little book. Closed or open? Open. What is that book? It is Daniel 8 through 12, primarily the 2300 day prophecy and the beginning of the judgment. That's right. That's the central content of the little book. So he descends from heaven. Is there a message that's going to come from this little book about the 2300 days and the judgment? Absolutely. There's a message that's going to come forth from this book. Now, how extensive is the message going to be? Wow. Not only does it come from Jesus, not only is it a message about the 2300 days and the judgment, but the angel then plants one foot on the sea, the right foot on the sea, and the left foot on the land. And uh, this means that this message from the little book concerning the judgment is going to be a global message to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Do you need a global church to proclaim a global message? Yes, we do. Even with technology, you still have to have a global church in order to proclaim a global message. What does the act of planting the feet mean? It means that the person who is planting the feet is claiming ownership. So what is Jesus claiming? He's saying this world is mine. And I'm going to soon take it over. The seventh trumpet, he takes it over. By the way, this is happening during the period of which trumpet? The sixth. So can this be in apostolic times? Can it be during the Middle Ages? Or is it at the very end of time? It's the very end of time because it's number six in the sequence. The seventh is when Jesus takes over the kingdoms. So it has to be right before the close of probation and the second coming of Jesus. Gives us a chronology of it. And after he plants his feet, representing the fact that this message from Jesus concerning the judgment of the 2300 days is going to be a global message, then he utters the roar of a lion. And when he roars like a lion, what is heard? Seven thunders. Did the thunders have an intelligible message? Could it be understood? Did John understand it? Yes. yes, John understood it because he said, I was about to write what the thunders uttered. So this is not, the thunders are not noise. The thunders utter a message. But John is told to do what? Seal, Seal what the thunders say. It's not best for the people who are going to go through this experience to know these things. And we've already noticed from an eyewitness, Ellen White, who was there, that there were a series of disappointments because they misinterpreted uh, several aspects. No year zero, uh, thinking that the Day of Atonement was going to take place in the spring instead of the fall, that is, spring and fall as we know it in the Northern Hemisphere. <laughs> I, I, I gotta make that clear. <laughs> And so, what we find is that there were going to be a series of disappointments because the text of the Bible was not going to be clearly understood. Now, who orchestrated that? Did God know that, they, that uh, Jesus wasn't going to come in 1843? So why did he ask William Miller to preach? Did uh, God know that Jesus was not going to come the spring of 1844, Northern Hemisphere? Yes. Did God know that Jesus wasn't going to come October 22, 1844? 
Of course. So why didn't he just make it clear? Because it was not best for people to know what the thunders uttered. Their faith needed to be what? <laughs> Tested. Because it needed to be revealed who was a true follower of Jesus and who wasn't. Are you with me? So after the seven thunders utter their voices, which are events primarily between 1842 and 1844, then the angel raises his right hand to heaven and swears an oath. And he swears that oath in the name of the everlasting God. The everlasting God who created the heavens and everything in them, the earth and everything in the earth, and the seas and everything in the seas. What does that indicate? There's going to be a call. This movement is going to present which commandment? They're going to come to a realization that the Sabbath is the rest day of the Lord. Are you with me? Does the first angel's message also attract attention to the Creator? Yes. See, that's where the message, that's the message from the little book, is the first angel's message. And so now, the angel, Jesus, symbolically presenting this message to his people, raises his right hand, not his left, like in Daniel, because he has a little book in his left, and he swears that time will be no longer. What time? This, uh, no, the close of probation? No. Uh, second coming? No. Because this is happening during which trumpet? Number six. When does probation close? Right before the seventh trumpet sounds. And when does Jesus come to take over the kingdoms? Under the seventh trumpet. So this t time coming to an end cannot refer to chronological time. What time is it referring to? It refers you back to unto 2300 days and the sanctuary shall be cleansed. It directs you back to Daniel 8.14. This movement is going to preach Daniel 8.14. Are you following me? Of course all of this explanation is an afterthought. No way. It was fulfilled too precisely. God was in this movement. This is God's movement. The Seventh-day Adventist movement. So then, after the angel <clears throat> swears the oath, the time will be no longer, and by the way, this, will be, this would be October 22, 1844, right? Because that's the last time prophecy. No more time prophecies after that. Then, and we're going to skip verse 7, because that's parenthetical. Remember we studied that? that, that does, it, it breaks the order, the flow of thought. Then John is told to eat the book. What does it mean to eat the book? We studied all these things. It means to assimilate the message, and what else? And proclaim it. Remember Ezekiel chapter 3, the parallel passage? So, did the Millerites assimilate the message concerning the judgment? Yes, they did. Did they proclaim it with all of their resources? Absolutely, they did. What kind of message was it? Oh, when they proclaimed it, it was what? Sweet. The judgment hour message was sweet because they believed the earth was the sanctuary. The cleansing of the sanctuary was Jesus was going to come. And they were going to see their beloved Lord. And He was going to live with them forever. Is there anything sweeter than that? No. It was sweet. But then, in the aftermath, when Jesus did not come on October 22, 1844, their experience became what? Bitter. Are you following the sequence? I didn't expect to take so much time. But we have so many new people here that you have to just catch the sequence. And so, after the sweet and bitter experience, 
John is told, and by the way, this is not really happening in the time of John because it's the sixth trumpet. John represents God's people at the end of time. Because John was dead during the sixth trumpet. He lived during the first trumpet, not number six. Are you with me? So now, John is told, and that represents the people that went through the disappointment, you must prophesy again. Now, what does the word again mean? Can you do something again unless you've done it at least once before? No. So when he says prophesy again, must it be a message similar to the first message that was given? Yes. And what was the first message? The message was the 2300 days, the judgment. The judgment was going to be begin. And the Creator. So John is being told, and John represents God's people at the end of time, that they must go out and they must proclaim the same message that the Millerites proclaimed, judgment hour, the Sabbath, etc., with a new understanding of what it means after the disappointment. Did God raise up a global movement to do that? He sure did. Shortly after 1844, there was a little nucleus of believers left. All of the others... All of the others said it was, it, you know, this was a delusion. But there was a little remnant that searched the scriptures and they said, you know, there has to be something. God was in this. We felt his spirit. We could see it. God was in it. What happened? So they went to the scriptures and studied. And to make a long story short, in the course of time, that little remnant grew. It grew into the Seventh-day Adventist church. The remnant church that God has called to preach what they preached. Again, with a new understanding. Is this making sense? You don't belong to just any church. This is not any old church. This is God's remnant church. And I don't say that arrogantly. It's the right kind of pride. Let me ask you, uh, I'll tell you, I'm proud to have that son there. He's been, he's been a tremendous help. God not only has given us a good son, but he's also given us a son that has, is helping in the proclamation of this message. I'm proud of him. So is that bad? No, there's a certain kind of pride that's good. <laughs> and so we should be proud to be Seventh-day Adventists. We should not be hiding our colors. We should not be trying to hide the Sabbath and say, Oh, the great disappointment. That was an embarrassment. Let's not say anything about that. We've got to say something about that. Because we've got to prophesy again. And you can't do it again without explaining what happened once upon a time. Now, we're at the point where we're going to look at, at the next point in the sequence. Revelation 11 verse 1 tells us what the prophesying again is all about. Do you remember that I mentioned that Revelation 11 1 be belongs to chapter 10? Yes. Let me read you a statement. Well, let's read first 11, uh, 11 1 and then I will read you a statement from Joseph Seiss, who is not an Adventist. He's a commentator from way back. Doesn't have everything straight. But he does have this point straight. Revelation 11.1 1 says, Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod. So what is John given? A reed like a measuring rod. And the angel stood saying, Rise and what? Measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. Now let me read you what Joseph Seiss had to say about the connection with, between Revelation 10, the last verse, and Revelation 11 verse 1. He had it straight. You know, some of these commentators, uh, you know, inadvertently 
they had things straight. A little, a little piece here and a little piece there. They just didn't have the complete picture. This is how he stated it. The connection between what concludes the one, that is what concludes chapter 10, and what begins the other, that is what begins chapter 11, appears to be as close as it well could be, seeing that the angel who before addressed John still continues here to address him. And the new injunction, rise and measure, is but a sequel to his previous injunction, thou must prophesy again. You understand what he's saying? 11.1 1 belongs to chapter 10. And in Revelation, constantly you have this phenomenon where the chapter division is in the wrong place. Because the translators were not Seventh-day Adventists. <laughs> See, if Seventh-day Adventists had, had actually done the translation, they would have known exactly where to divide the chapter. So maybe we need a Seventh-day Adventist Bible. Not that, not that we're going to change the text, but we'll make the chapter divisions where they're really supposed to be. Now, let's ask some questions about this verse. Which temple is being spoken of in Revelation 11 verse 1? Is it the heavenly temple, or is it the earthly temple, or I might add, is it both? It's not in your syllabus, but you want to add that. Is it both? Second question. What does it mean to measure the temple, the altar, and those who worship there? Question number three. What is symbolized by the measuring rod that measures the temple? Question number four. Which altar is being referred to? There were two altars, the altar of sacrifice and the altar of incense. Is it the altar of sacrifice in the court or the altar of incense in the holy place? And finally, the last question answers the previous one. Why does the altar of sin incense have to be measured? Good questions. Now let's look for the answer to the questions. The fundamental mistake that was made by the Millerites is that they believed and taught that the earth was the sanctuary that needed to be cleansed. This in spite of the fact that there's not one verse in the Bible that says that the sanctuary is the earth. It was an assumption on their part. There can be no doubt that the temple that is to be measured after the great disappointment is the heavenly temple, the heavenly sanctuary. More specifically, the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. It can't be the earthly temple. Because the earthly temple was destroyed in the year 70 AD. And has never been rebuilt. So there was no earthly temple in 1844. So it can't be referring to the earthly temple. Furthermore, the book of Hebrews makes it absolutely clear. That when the temple veil was rent from top to bottom the sanctuary service shifted from the earthly sanctuary to the heavenly sanctuary the entire book of Hebrews tells us that the focus of Christians now should not be a third rebuilt temple in the Middle East the focus of Christians today should be where? should be in the heavenly sanctuary, because that's where Jesus is. Don't focus your eyes where Jesus isn't. So in Hebrews 8, 1 and 2 it says, Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary, and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. Where does Jesus serve today? In which temple? The heavenly sanctuary. So which would be the temple that would be um, measured uh, after the great disappointment? It would have to be the heavenly temple. Now, some people would say, but pastor, you know, um, do things in heaven have to be measured? Aren't all of the measures correct? Do heavenly things have to be cleansed? Isn't everything in heaven clean? That's one argument that the evangelicals will, will, will present to Adventists and some Adventist theologians. They say, listen, this idea that Adventists have that 
when a person confesses their sins because they repented and they trust in Jesus, that the sins are introduced into the sanctuary and they defile the heavenly sanctuary. There can't be anything in heaven that defiles. And you know what my answer is? Was Jesus absolutely perfect and pure? Did he assume sin? So if a sinless Lord can assume sin, a sinless sanctuary can also assume sin. Are you with me? It's just that sin did not belong to Jesus. And sin does not belong to the sanctuary. That's why sin has to be eradicated from the sanctuary. Like it has to be eradicated from the life. And that will be our topic this afternoon. You're saying, well, all of this is very interesting, very theoretical. This afternoon we're going to apply it personally. Because while Jesus cleanses things up there, He has invited us to cleanse things down here. We're supposed to be doing what the people did on the Day of Atonement. There it comes to us. Do the heavenly things need to be cleansed? Notice Hebrews 9.23. Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens, what are the copies? The earthly sanctuary. Should be what? Purified with these, that is with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with what? With better sacrifices than these. But listen now. The temple to be cleansed in 1844 was not the entirety of the sanctuary. It is the most holy place of the sanctuary. You say, how do you know that? Very simple. In the New Testament, there are two main words that are translated temple. And in English, you would never know that they are different words. For example, in the book of Acts, every time that the Jewish temple is referred to, the Greek word hieron is used. It means the entire temple complex. That's not the word that's used in Revelation. In fact, that word is never used in Revelation. The word that is used in Revelation is the word naos. It's used 16 times. And in every single instance, it refers to the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And that includes Revelation 11.1 1, where it says measure the temple. It's the most holy place that has to be measured. Interesting. After the disappointment was there a focus upon the most holy place? And a work of judgment that had begun in the most holy place? Of course all of this is a coincidence. Adventists don't know what they're missing. Adventists don't really realize what they're missing today. We have become evangelical Seventh-day Adventists. No, no knock on evangelicals. They have a certain amount of truth. But not present truth. So we should not backtrack and say, let's preach what they're preaching. We have to encourage them to preach what we're preaching. Notice this text where the word naos is used, so that you know where the temple is that's going to be cleansed. Revelation 11 verse 19. Then the temple, the naos, of God was opened in heaven. Now if it was opened, before it must have been closed. Now, where does that door that is open lead to? It says, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his naos. What is the naos? The most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Because that is where the ark of the covenant is, folks. You follow me so far? I want to make sure. Now you'll notice what happens when the temple is opened. It says there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. By the way, the hail is not ice. It is fiery hail. 
because it burns. Later on in Revelation, you'll find that. So there's, according to this, there's lightning, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and fiery hail. Can you think of some other time in his, the history of God's people where you had those same phenomena? Yes, in Egypt. No, you don't have thunder and lightning in Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 2. When God gave the Ten Commandments, what is inside the Ark of the Covenant? What does the Roman Church discover shortly after 1844? Say, wow, they go to the most holy place, there's the Ark of the Covenant. Inside the Ark of the Covenant is what? The law. And in the center of the law is the Sabbath. So suddenly they start discovering the distinctive truths of the Adventist church because they've got into the most holy place where those truths are revealed. Why doesn't the Christian world keep the Sabbath and why do they believe the law was nailed to the cross and that the judgment is at the second coming? Because they have refused to enter the most holy place. Because if they entered there they would see the law is still binding, the Sabbath is still binding, that the judgment is taking place there in heaven, that we should practice health reform, the pot of manna taught that, Numbers 11, and that the dead are dead. You say, how, do, how, how, how would they discover that the dead are dead? Listen, the first person to be judged in 1844 was Adam. Where was Adam in 1844? He was dead. So how could Adam appear before the judgment seat of Christ in 1844 if he was dead? He appeared there through the record of his life in the books. By the way, I believe that if God was speaking today, he wouldn't speak of books. He'd speak of computers. It's just in the biblical times, Ellen White uses photography. Our lives are being photographed. See, because time's advanced and you can use new illustrations. Our lives are being computed. God is an exact replica of who we are here. So, in 1844, when God said, Adam, present yourself before my judgment seat, the angels went and brought the DVD. <laughs> the DVD without missing anything of the whole life of Adam. And God puts it in the D I'm dramatizing so you can understand. God puts it in the DVD player on the large screen. <laughs> and the heavenly jury is present and God says, okay, look at Adam. Let me, let me ask you this. Is there a certain sense in which Adam is presenting himself alive before Christ's judgment seat? Yes, because the record was made while he was alive. They're watching the living Adam through his record, although he's physically dead. And so, when the case of Adam is examined, Jesus says to the heavenly jury, okay, you've seen Adam, you've seen all his sins, yes. But he confessed his sins, he repented of them. He had faith in Jesus. And by the power of God he overcame. Uh, what does the heavenly jury say? Keep him in the book of life. When you come, when you, when you go back to the earth, you can bring him home. You know what, what many say in the Adventist church? They say, oh, this idea that you need to place your sins in the sanctuary. So that takes away our assurance of salvation because the sins are up there in the sanctuary. <laughs> Let me tell you this. Our greatest assurance is to have our sins in the sanctuary because if they're not there, they're here. You better make sure you don't keep them here. You better make sure that through repentance, confession, and faith in Jesus, you place your sins in the sanctuary because if they're in the sanctuary, you're safe because they're covered by the blood. So don't let anybody tell you that sending our sins to the sanctuary takes away our assurance of salvation. It is the greatest assurance of salvation. 
I'm not going to read Exodus. Well, maybe we should read Exodus 19. <laughs> no, that's the same phenomena. See, when the Ark of the Covenant is seen, the law is seen. So now you have the same phenomena as at Sinai. It says, then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and what? This, there you have it. And a thick cloud on the mountain and the sound of the trumpet was very loud so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord had descended upon it in what? Fire. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by voice. So you have thunder, you have lightning, you, that it says that the, that the mountain what? Shook and you have fire. Because God is about to reveal his what? He's about to reveal his law. Was he going to reveal his law in 1844, which is the standard of the judgment? Yes, he was. Now let's notice Revelation 15 verses 5 through 8. Revelation chapter 15 verses 5 through 8. This will nail down the idea that the naos in the book of Revelation refers to the most holy place. We looked at this yesterday, but let's look at it again. After these things, I looked, and behold, the temple, naos, of the tabernacle of the testimony. Now let's stop there for a minute. What is the tabernacle of the testimony? It's the entire tent. But the tabernacle of the testimony has a temple. What is the temple of the tabernacle? The most holy place. So it's not the same to say that the temple is the entire holy and most holy place. Because here it makes a distinction. The tabernacle of the testimony has a temple. And the temple is the most holy place. So it says that it's open. But here it's not open so that sinners can go in. It's open so the plague angels can come out. Which means that at this point, what happens with probation? Closes. Continue saying, and out of the temple, out of the naos, out of the most holy place. Incidentally, can you think of any episode in the Bible where the Ark of the Covenant poured out plagues? The Philistines. The plagues come from the Ark of the Covenant. Because the law of God has been what? Trampled upon. So it says, Out of the temple came the seven angels, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, having their chests girded with golden bands. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls, full of the wrath of God. So has probation closed at this point? Yes, because the fullness of God's wrath, without any mixture, is going to be poured out. Verse 8, the temple, the naos, the most holy place, was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power. And no one was able to enter the naos. Nobody was able to enter the most holy place till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Now here's a big question. How can earthlings worship in heaven? Because it says we need to measure the heavenly temple and those who worship therein. Can that be referring to worshiping in an earthly structure? No, because in 1844 there was no earthly temple. So in what sense can earthlings, can believers on earth, worship in the heavenly temple? The fact is, folks, that God's people worship in the heavenly temple because they enter the most holy place by faith, where Jesus now intercedes for his people and is performing a work of judgment. You know, it's interesting, when you look at the Old Testament sanctuary, the people could see what went on in the court, but they could not see what went on in the holy and most holy place. They had to follow the work of the, high, of the priest by faith. That's why God gave a description of the sanctuary so that they could follow what the priest was doing. Let me ask you, could human beings see what Jesus did in the camp when he lived in our midst? Did people see him and hear him? Did human beings see him die on the cross? Did they see him after his resurrection? 
Can we see him today? No. We can enter the sanctuary and worship there. How? By faith. By faith. Notice Hebrews 4, verses 14 through 16. Seeing that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Can we come to heaven to the throne of grace now? Certainly. In what way? By faith. So can we worship in heaven even though we live on earth? Yes. yes. So it says, let, let, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. But now there's another reality that we need to take into account. And that is that the literal heavenly temp the literal temple is in heaven. And we go into that literal temple and worship how? By faith. But there's also, also an earthly temple. What is the earthly temple? The church. The church. Let me ask you this. Does the Bible speak about the Antichrist sitting in the temple of God? By the way, it's the word naos. Who is that Antichrist that sits in the temple of God? The papacy. So, so does he sit within the church? Yes. So the temple not only refers to the literal heavenly temple, but the earthly reflection, spiritual reflection of the heavenly temple is the church. So what's going to be measured? Only the sanctuary in heaven or also those who worship at that temple, who surround the temple spiritually. Are you following me? Now I'm going to skip. Incidentally, the Apostle Paul, every time he uses the word temple, it's the word nows. Never does he use hieron. I'm going to skip down because time has uh, flown by to Ephesians 2. I'm going to prove to you that the, earth, that the church on earth is an earthly reflection of the heavenly temple. So would Jesus only have to measure the records in heaven or would he have to measure people on earth? He would have to measure the church on earth. Notice what Paul said in Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Are those spiritual so stones? Are they spiritual stones? Yes. Yeah, because Peter was not a literal stone. John was not a literal stone. So when it says that the foundation of apostles and prophets, those are spiritual stones. They're not literal stones. They're people. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Is that a spiritual stone? Yes. Now, we are built on the foundation of apostles and prophets and upon Jesus the chief cornerstone. It says, in whom the whole building. So is this a literal building or a spiritual building? Spiritual, spiritual building. In whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy naos in the Lord. And by the way, the Old Testament sanctuary had the literal Shekinah. Does the church have the Shekinah today? It's the Holy Spirit. Not visible to human eyes. So it says, in whom you also are built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Now I skipped a lot of what, what deals with the, um, with the man of sin. Let me just mention this. The Bible says that God sits between the cherubim. In the heavenly temple. 
this is very interesting. This has happened more than once. Pope Benedict XVI, at the conclusion of the week for Christian unity in St. Paul's outside the wall, sat on a great white throne. And on each side of the throne was a cherub. By that, he was announcing symbolically that he occupies the place of the great Jehovah, who sits between the cherubim, according to Psalm 80, verse 1. How could the Bible be clearer? Now, what does it mean to measure? Are you following me so far? What does it mean to measure the worshipers that go in there by faith, to measure the heavenly temple, to examine the records up there? What does that mean? To measure. Well, let's skip 2 Kings 21, 13, because of the time. Let's read Matthew 7, verse 2. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, same identical Greek word as in Revelation 11, and with the measure you use, it will be what? Measured back to you. What does it mean to measure? So after the great disappointment, what is starting? What, what do God's people have to announce? The judgment has begun. The task of measuring the heavenly temple, examining the heavenly records, and also measuring the church that worships on earth. Listen to this statement from Ellen White. Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 972. The grand judgment is taking place and has been going on for some time. Now the Lord says, measure the temple. She's quoting Revelation 11, verse 1. Now the Lord says, measure the temple and the worshipers thereof. Remember, when you are walking the streets about your business, God is measuring you. See, not only the heavenly sanctuary, the record's up there. He's measuring us. When you are attending your household duties, when you engage in conversation, God is measuring you. Remember that your words and actions are being daguerreotyped. That's an old English word for photographed in the books of heaven as the face is reproduced by the artist of the polished plate. What is the measuring tape that is used in the act of measuring? The law. Let me read you this statement from Ellen White. She's writing to a judgmental woman. She's, Ellen White wrote, You can be a blessing. You can help such as need help. But you must, must lay down your measuring tape. <laughs> I like that. For that is not for you to use. One who is unerring in judgment, who understands the weakness of our fallen, corrupt natures, holds the standard himself. He weighs in the balances of the sanctuary and is just measure we shall all accept. In Signs of the Times, December 29, 1887, Ellen White wrote, When the judgment is set and the books are opened, your life and mine will be measured by the law of the Most High. So what is the measuring tape? The law of God. Unfortunately, before the law of God, we are all pygmies. Nobody can pass the test of standing before the law. That's why we have to accept Jesus as our Savior, so that He stands in our place in the judgment. Now, you're probably wondering, okay, we understand now, measure the temple, that's the heavenly sanctuary, the record's up there. Measure those who worship, which is the reflection on earth, the believers on earth. But why measure the altar? Why measure the altar of incense? There's a very important reason. How do people draw near to the throne of grace? Prayer. Through prayer. Now listen. The altar of incense was in the holy place. But its orientation was towards the most holy place. That's why Hebrews places it in the most holy place. Because what would happen is, the, the, the priest would bring the incense and place it on the altar, and the smoke would go over the veil into the presence of God. That represented that the prayers of God's people were going into the presence of God. 
So even though the, the, the physical altar was in the holy place, its orientation was towards the throne of God in the most holy place. Now, let's notice Luke 1, 8 through 10, where you have the symbol and what is represented by the symbol. You have the incense and what the incense represents. It says there, it's speaking about Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist. It was his turn to serve in the sanctuary. And it says, so it was that while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. What were the people doing outside? And the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of incense. So you have the literal symbol, the incense, and you have what it represents, the prayers of the saints. Notice Psalm 141 and verse 2. Once again, prayer linked with incense. It says, let my prayer be set before you as what? Incense. The lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. But listen carefully. The incense is not prayer. The prayers are mingled with incense. Notice Revelation 8, 3 and 4. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense, listen carefully now, that he, he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. So even though prayer is related to incense, prayer is mingled with the incense to go to the presence of God. Notice this beautiful statement from Ellen White. In Heavenly Places, page 69. Christ has pledged himself to be our substitute and surety, and he neglects no one. There is an inexhaustible fund of perfect obedience accruing from his obedience. I love that. An inexhaustible fund. He's deposited enough, enough currency in heaven for every single person to be saved. But you have to come and claim the capital. See, if a bank has all the resources for you to pay all your debts, but you don't come to the bank, you're still in debt. She continues writing, In heaven, his merits, his self-denial, and self-sacrifice are treasured up as incense to be offered up with the prayers of his people. As the sinners, what kind of prayers? Sincere, humble prayers ascend to the throne of God. Christ mingles them with the merits of his life of perfect, perfect obedience. Our prayers are made fragrant by his incense. Isn't that beautiful? And now listen carefully. Are all prayers sincere? Does everybody who confess sin really sorry for sin? So would it be necessary to distinguish those who were truly sorry and those who weren't in a judgment? See, that's the measuring of the altar. Is the sincerity of prayer. You no, know, the Bible teaches that forgiveness can be revoked. Do you know that when we confess our sins, at that point, God doesn't take into account whether our repentance is sincere or not. He takes us at our word. But in the judgment, it will be revealed whether our repentance and confession was true or not. Remember the story of the two debtors? The guy who was forgiven 10,000 talents, he could never pay that. He cried out to his master, and his master said, because you cried out to me, I'm making a long story short, because you cried out to me, I forgive your debt. You can go. I don't have to pay anything? Nope. Paid for. Oh, he says, this is incredible. My master paid for a debt that I incurred that I could never pay. And I got out of prison in certain debts. So now he goes out the door, and he finds someone who owes him 100 denarii. Was this person forgiven? 
the state, the, wor- the, the Bible says he was forgiven. But he had crocodile tears. And it was shown by his works. You're saved by grace through faith, but works show if your faith is genuine or not. This guy, he says, wow, I got off the hook. Hallelujah. I don't have to stay in prison. I get all my stuff back. But he wasn't sorry. He was sorry he was going to go to prison. But he wasn't sorry that he had embezzled money from his master. So he goes out, he finds this guy that owes him a pittance. Well, it was a significant amount. 100 denarii was 100 days of work. But it could be paid in installments. He says, pay me what you owe me. This person says the same thing. He says, oh, please, give me time and I'll pay. What? I'm not going to give you any time. He grabs him by the neck and he's choking him. Was he really sorry? No, he wasn't sorry. His works showed that he wasn't sorry. Was his forgiveness revoked? It was. In full. He was thrown into a prison until he paid every single penny. You don't use pennies here, do you? You know what I mean. Notice the Bible has some things to say about counterfeit prayers. So in the judgment, it's going to be examined whether our prayers were genuine or not. Proverbs 28, verse 9, One who turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. Jeremiah 7, 16, Therefore do not pray for these people, God tells Jeremiah, nor lift up a cry of prayer for them, nor make intercession to me, for I will not hear you. Because they were in rebellion against God. Psalm 66, 18 and 19. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. But certainly God has heard me. He has attended the voice of my prayer. Are you understanding why the altar needs to be measured? The prayer life, the sincerity of our prayer life needs to be measured to see if we're truly sorry, truly confessing, and truly trusting in Jesus, which is seen in our works. Works don't save us, but works reveal whether we're saved. We are not saved by faith alone. We're not saved by works alone. We're not saved by faith plus works. We are saved by a faith that works. And if it doesn't work, it's not faith. Hebrews 11, everyone in Hebrews 11 is doing something. You know, God says to Abraham, Abraham, I'm going to make you, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. And Abraham says, thank you, Lord, for this great revelation. And God says, no, but, but you've got to leave. Oh, no, no, I trust you, Lord. God says to Noah, I'm going to send a worldwide flood. Oh, really? Look, the Lord will provide. What does Noah do? He builds. Even Abraham and Sarah, when they were old, they had sex. (laughs) Yep. Abraham offered his son. Abel offered a sacrifice. Everyone in Hebrews 11, the, the... Those who have faith are individuals who are doing something. Faith is an action word. It's not something that you have in your brain. It's something that is manifested in action. Now, will you give me just a couple of extra minutes? A couple of prophetic minutes. (laughs) No, no, no. If If it was a couple of prophetic minutes... We wouldn't be out of here today. Now, somebody might say, but why would God's own people be measured? Why measure God's own people? You can understand measuring the wicked, because they're wicked. But measuring God's people? You know, Albert Barnes was a great Bible commentator from long ago. And he had these interesting words. There is some apparent incongruity. You you know what incongruity means? An apparent contradiction. In directing him to measure those who were engaged in worship. 
So why would you measure those who are worshiping God, is what he's saying. But the obvious meaning is that he was to take a correct estimate of their character. Of what they professed. Of the reality of their piety. Of their lives. And of the general state of the church considered as professedly worshiping God. He's not an Adventist. But he, but he understood it. Unfortunately, he didn't have all of the picture of Revelation 10, etc. Does the Bible say that the house of God is going to be judged? Yes. In fact, it says in 1 Peter 4, 17, that judgment will begin at the house of God. And what is the house of God? 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15 says, the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy, these things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, but if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. So if judgment begins in the house of God, judgment must begin with the church, with those who claimed the name of Jesus. I'm not going to review again. I'll just go to two closing statements. It's not a coincidence, folks, that God raised up the Seventh-day Adventist Church shortly after 1844 to obey the order to prophesy again, announcing to the world that God is measuring the heavenly sanctuary and those who worship there. God established this organization to make it possible to take the three angels' message to the world. This is the reason for our existence and woe be to us if we fail to live up to our calling. I believe in church organization. I believe that God wanted the Seventh-day Adventist Church organized on a global level with one purpose and that was to plant Seventh-day Adventists in every country of the world so that they could proclaim this message. Because it was going to go global to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And so God has blessed the Seventh-day Adventist Church to extend itself all over the world. But it's not enough just to extend ourselves all over the world if we're not presenting the message. Because the purpose of planting Adventists everywhere is to share this message. Ellen White expressed it this way, two clo closing quotations. In a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen. What is a watchman? That is a defensive position. It's to defend. Must we defend the truth from the incursion of the enemy? Yes. So Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen, but it's not enough to defend. And light bearers. That's an offensive one. Not only to defend, but to conquer. Then she states, To them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the Word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import. Import means importance. What is that work? The proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's messages. There is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. Not even women's ordination. Which is a huge distraction. I don't agree with women's ordination. I don't think it's biblical. But what we have done, we've spent millions of dollars. Thousands and thousands of hours arguing over this while the world perishes. Final quotation. In the balances of the sanctuary, the Seventh-day Adventist church is to be weighed. Not only is God going to weigh people, He's going to weigh the church. You know, there's no, there's no way that God chooses a church unconditionally. 
I know we say, all oh, the church as we know it is going to go through and because this is the remnant church. The Jews said the same thing in their day. Scary thought. I believe that this is God's church. Don't get me wrong. Amen. But it will be weighed in the balances of the sanctuary. She continues writing, she will be judged by the privileges and advantages that she has had, which are many. If her spiritual experience, the church, not individuals, the church, if her spiritual experience does not correspond to the advantages that Christ at infinite cost has bestowed on her, if the blessings conferred have not qualified her to do the work entrusted to her on her, will be pronounced the sentence, found wanting by the light bestowed, the opportunities given, will she be judged? We need to pray for this church that the Lord will bring it back to where he wants it to be. The world needs this message now. Not the, the, the gospel light that's being proclaimed. Not the message of Joel Osteen or Rick Warren or Kenneth Copeland. There's no message for this time there. God is calling us to proclaim the distinctive present truth message of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And woe to us if we get distracted and we don't do it. You understand what we studied today? Does it make sense? Don't miss at 4 o'clock this afternoon. If you're planning on leaving, cancel your plans. <laughs> because we're going to talk about the final generation on this earth. And we are going to see very clearly what our duty is while the heavenly sanctuary is being cleansed. We're going to study what the people did during the Day of Atonement. See, God not only said, you know, this is what the high priest does on the Day of Atonement, He gives the luxury of detail of what the people were supposed to be doing. And we are the people gathered at the sanctuary. So we're going to have to do what they did. What did they do? Don't miss the next exciting episode. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the sure word of prophecy. We thank you, Father, for the privilege of belonging to this remnant church. But it's not only a privilege, it's a great responsibility. Woe to us if we just enjoy the privileges and we don't fulfill our responsibility. Father, we love this church. This is your church. You love it more than we do. You gave your son to die for this church. But Father, the church to a great degree has gone astray from the reason of its existence. Lord, I ask that through your miraculous power, you will bring it back to where you want it to be. So that we can finish the work that you have given to your church in latter rain power. Thank you, Father, for having been with us and for answering our prayer. For we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.